All right, so we're, we're going to cut this down a little bit, but what I'm, what I'm here to talk about is, is uh, injury prevention and performance strategies. So the first, the first question I want to ask you guys is, is what is injury prevention? And I think this is a key question to highlight the theme of this presentation, and that is why are we doing what we're doing, okay? So with injury prevention, I think we, we sort of stereotype it a little bit, and we think certain things uh, about injury prevention when we add a physio ball to something or when we add a BOSU ball or just because there's a band involved or we're doing a corrective with an ankle mobe, then that means that's injury preventative in nature. When in reality, I would contest that if I have a 60 minute session with, with a team, uh, that whole 60 minute session is meant for injury prevention first. If you ask any strength coach what's their, what's their, first and foremost, what is their role as a strength and conditioning coach, it is to reduce the instance of injury. And then performance sort of comes from that or stems from that strength, power, whatever training quality you're trying to develop. So as we go this, through this presentation, keep that in mind that everything is going to be treated as injury prevention. And why is that? I think the why really stems from probably my inquisitive nature and really asking that question constantly and thinking, you know, uh, what, are the, what are these band walks, what are these hip bridges really doing when we need to get that athlete on the field and do something aggressive in nature? Does that carry over? So in the past, at least in the strength and conditioning world, and you know, I think the same with the rehab world is, we hear a lot of these buzzwords and these, and these buzz phrases, and I think the three main ones are activation, mobility, and stability. So we, we talk about these things, and I think we have good intentions when it comes to this stuff, but I don't know if we really have a handle on exactly what we're doing. So I think as strength coaches, sometimes we sound smart, but we don't really know the substance behind this stuff. Phrases like mobility before stability. The athlete has a weak core. The athlete cannot activate his glutes. Let's get them on a back program. The EMG shows their glutes are activating. What does that all mean? And I think it goes a little bit deeper than what we, what we think at the moment. Um, and we have to sort of get better with how we apply these exercises to train these qualities. So before we get into this, my injury prevention mission statement. And the key point, and I know because we're limited in time, is this bottom, bottom portion here is using an integrative neurological approach. And that's what we're going to talk most about during the presentation. So these are things that I think about when it comes to injury prevention. First and foremost, there needs to be an assessment. And that assessment is going to come from a team of individuals and support staff, strength and conditioning coach, athletic trainer, physical therapist, massage therapist, doctor, whatever it is. We need to all come together to develop some sort of assessment protocol for all our athletes to get relevant information, objective information. Next is exercise choice. And of course, if I were to say exercise, you know, choose a good exercise. Of course we need to do that, right? But we need to know what the good exercises are. And we'll talk about that as well. Breathing is extremely important. I think that's another thing that uh, a sort of a fashionable topic over the past several years where we talk about diaphragmatic breathing or breathing into your belly or, you know, certain things that we try to implement into performance training. But again, I don't think we know really the intricacies of that concept. It's not enough to just tell an athlete, hey man, you're not supposed to breathe into your chest and lift your shoulders, you're supposed to breathe into your belly. Well, how, does, how do we educate and integrate that into something that's performance related? Education, education is the number one thing. I think of myself more as an educator, so much more than a strength and conditioning coach. So I need to empower my athletes to make sure that they're gonna do these things when I'm not looking. So most of the time, your athletes are gonna be not under your watchful eye. So, over summer breaks, over Thanksgiving breaks, spring break, uh, when they want to do extra on their own? Have we empowered those athletes to know exactly what is right for them and how they should do it? Technique, of course, is important. If you ask a strength and conditioning coach, you know, hey, what do you think of technique? Of course, what are they going to say? They're going to say, hey, you know, I'm a technique guy. I really focus on technique. Again, what does that mean? Do you know exactly what great technique is for each of these movements? So we have to continue to educate or our strength, have our strength and conditioning coaches continue to be educated. Programming. We won't talk too much about programming, but of course we have to progress. And then retesting to assess if this stuff is actually working objectively. So try to categorize some of these things when it comes to injury, injury prevention. What I want to highlight first is, is, a, is the warm-up. So I try not to use warm-up anymore in any of our training with our athletes because it, it connotates something where we're gonna take 10 minutes and we're gonna warm up for something else. 
well, I don't want to take 10 minutes to warm up for something else. I want to perform 60 minutes of training. So this stuff needs to be worth it. So I don't need, you know, some of the times we get stuck on this activation, mobility, stability. And basically, we're, doing, we're just doing things to get ready for something else. We're not actually making a performance change. And I think that's a key difference we need to understand. If you're going to have a big squat day with some of your athletes or a big deadlift when it comes to our realm, and you need to get them ready and that's all you care about, sure, then that's just your warm up. But don't, you know, don't confuse that with something that's actually making a change. Correctives. So with correctives, that's another term in our strength and conditioning world, and I think rehab as well, especially with the popularity of the functional movement screen, is we apply these correctives. But what we need to know is that these correctives actually have to make a change. So within a short amount of time, they need to make a change. And if they don't, then we're taking the wrong route. So we need to continually audit our programs and make sure we're actually, like I said in the beginning, doing what we think we're doing. The main thing we're going to talk about is this integrative approach divided into low threshold and high threshold movements. So the high threshold is gonna kind of blend into the performance as well. So when we talk about performance, again, we're talking about performance from an injury preventative standpoint at all times, first and foremost. And we'll show you how and why we do that. And then again, with periodization, of course, just um, progressing correctly. So getting into the meat of pr uh, the presentation uh, with transfer training, talking about transfer training. So the top three pictures, what do you see? Three separate exercises. You see a plank, a trap bar deadlift, and a conventional deadlift. So the plank, uh, he's in a position, he's training a quality what? He's training core stability. That's our goal with that exercise, low level core stability. Trap bar deadlift, easy way to, to kind of add resistance to a hip hinge, right? But does that plank plus the trap bar deadlift equal proficiency on a barbell deadlift? No, it doesn't. We're going from isolation, we're going from a different movement, and then expecting these two things combined to then transfer to this, this barbell deadlift. So what does that sound like? Sounds like athletics, right? Where we try to isolate, and then all of a sudden integrate into something very aggressive, and that doesn't necessarily mean that that athlete's gonna be successful in that aggressive movement. So even though the muscle and its anatomical function can reach maximum potential, its integration into a specific postural function can be quite insufficient and the muscle fails in this function. So again, that integration, how are we doing that? So the bottom highlights this a little bit more, more uh, related to athletics. So the bottom two pictures, we have sideline clamshell, one leg hip bridge, and then we have Usain Bolt sprinting. So I get, uh, from my athletic trainers, a lot of times you get that whole, like the athlete can't activate their glutes. Well, if we put them in a clamshell position and we say glute turn on, hip bridge, glute, turn on. Does that mean they're gonna stand up, do something aggressive, and utilize their glutes? I don't know if that's true. I think, it, I think it's a, a little bit deeper, and I think we need to work some sort of integrative uh, patterns into this to make that transfer a little bit smoother. So the first uh, examples of these low threshold integrated movements, I'll talk about some of these movements are influenced by a, a training modality uh, known as dynamic neuromuscular stabilization. So in DNS, DNS is based off of, for those of you who are not familiar, developmental sequencing. So basically baby movements. So when you know, a baby develops, they go from supine to sideline to quadruped to tripod to squat to standing to walking. So if we can tap into some of those neurological integrations, we can utilize or we can make exercises that sort of fit that mold as well and sort of tap into those uh, pure neurological integrations with athletes that we have now. So what I like about DNS as well is they integrate good things with breathing. So not only are we integrating the kinetic chain from head to toe, but we're also breathing over that integration. So it's breathing over a challenge. We're not just saying breathe into your belly, we're gonna challenge you first and then breathe over that challenge. So the first video I'm gonna show is bad technique on an exercise known as a dead bug. So just so we know where, where I'm coming from. So as noted by the note there, terrible dead bug technique. So this is just an exercise that we all use, but are we, are we maximizing the potential of that exercise? We can say do dead bugs, but how are we performing those dead bugs? So what's wrong with this? There's no tempo, there's no deliberacy, there's no details, there's no breathing. At one point my head's coming up, so we have that cervical flexion, which we don't want. So this is something, you know, how does the, how does the athlete know? That's our job. Where's the education when it comes to this sort of movement? So when we show the bottom video here, hopefully we can show them at the same time. 
we'll first show a bird dog movement. So bird dog, same, contralateral challenge, but we're gonna educate the athlete on how to establish neutral first through the year, from head to uh, bottom or low back. Once that contralateral challenge happens, what are we doing? Are we pushing through this arm? Are we pushing through that arm that's on the ground and interacting with the serratus anterior? Are we breathing over that challenge? Same with the dead bug. When we get into the dead bug, we get into that contralateral challenge, let's breathe in this position. Get into the challenge and then challenge that athlete to breathe three to five times in that movement. Same thing, another example of how we kind of create tension in that dead bug movement. Again, we're trying to maximize how much tension we can create in this movement, educate the athlete on how we can maximize this movement and make it injury preventative. So if we don't make it, if we don't focus on this technique, then it's not gonna be an injury preventative exercise. Another example is some low threshold work. So again, like I said, breathing to your belly is only gonna take you so far. The top picture is somebody doing crocodile breath. So basically they're in that prone position and they're breathing into their belly. Good education, but we need to take that to the next step. So these bottom two videos here, or these exercises here, are examples taken strictly from DNS, taken strictly from uh, sort of these developmental sequence moving, uh, movement patterns. So what we'll see in the first video is me cueing the athlete on how to get into a correct position. Now at first it's coaching intensive, but if you educate the athlete well enough, then these athletes are gonna be able to do this on their own. So at first we're trying to establish neutral, so we're getting that athlete out of extension. Do they know what that means? Do they know what getting out of hyperextension means? Hopefully we're educating on that. Educating on them uh, on how to activate their posterior chain in the movement. Once they've created that tension and that pressure and they're in the correct position, those knees are gonna come off the ground and that athlete's gonna start walking back into a bottom of a squat position. Taking it slow, so I'm cueing that athlete the whole time to keep a tall spine. Once they come up into the bottom of a squat position, we're creating some external rotation, activation of the posterior chain, breathing into the belly, solidifying the core. Until that happens, we're not gonna stand up. Once it happens, we'll stand up. So as we watch it again, again, how do we cue this athlete? How do we educate? You know, why, why am I, you know, if I'm doing this to an athlete, you know, why am I doing this to the athlete? Do they know? Do they buy into this? And that's what you have to do. How do you create that buy-in? And you create the buy-in because this is about performance. This is about you doing things better on the field and performing movements better. So as we go through this, again, it's about position, teaching the athlete what these correct positions are and how do we integrate. So again, integration is the key. Not only are we breathing just into your belly, but we're challenging you from head to toe. So look at this exercise as your new front plank. Look at that bear position as your new front plank, a better version of that, a more purposeful version of that. That's injury preventative. Same thing with the oblique sit, iso hold. So oblique sit is just this sideline position here. So I'm cueing this athlete to create some integration with that forearm and the ground. We're really trying to push the ground away, establish some neutrality through the torso or from head to low back. This is actually a transitional pattern, something you can use moving into quadruped, which we won't do in this. But this athlete, again, is getting tall. Once they're in that position, we're gonna rotate that left hip over the right. Once he's done that, the right hip comes off the ground. Once I cue him on his torso position and he starts to breathe, then we can cue him to bring that, in this case, his right foot off the ground for more glute activation. So head to toe, it's a challenge. From head, shoulder, core, glute, everything is being challenged here. Better side plank, more purposeful side plank. So again, knowledge is power in this situation. Are we satisfied with 30 athletes just doing side planks for 30 seconds? Or can we maximize the injury preventative nature of this exercise by doing something better? Moving into high threshold. So uh, I'll talk, what I'll talk about here is, is ACL preventative work. So um, something that we all do uh, from a performance standpoint, from an athletic training standpoint, um, we want to, you know, go through and do things that are uh, going to prevent ACL tears. And what do you see a lot of times? There's, you know, band walks. There's, you know, sort of band around the knees and knees coming in and out here. Uh, we're doing jumps and focusing on the landing, things like that, hop to stick. And that's the exercise we're going to focus on or, or what I'll use to kind of highlight this point is this hop to stick movement. So at the top here, what do, what do we say? Post-operative and return to sport rehabilitation programs that challenge dynamic neuromuscular control, facilitate technique perfection, and enhance limb symmetry may also successfully reduce the movement impairments associated with second injury risk. So again, key words here. Neuromuscular control and facilitate technique perfection. 
Below that, therefore, achieving optimal trunk stabilization should be the first step when training optimal movement of strength. So achieving optimal trunk stabilization. So are we looking at the knee or are we looking at the trunk? So the first hop version in this is hop without core control. So I'm trying to hop and demonstrate bad hops. So this third one again, we're leaning. So where are we looking? Are we cueing the athlete at the knee and saying something has to happen at the knee or are we first talking about their core? Hey, remember that core exercise we just did in the beginning, that bear position to the oblique sit. Remember that feeling that you have. I want you to replicate that feeling with something a little bit more dynamic that you're familiar with. So can we hop with core control? Are we cueing the athlete at the knee or are we educating them about their torso position and about their core control? And that's what I think, again, educate our athletes first and you as a coach know where we should be looking. Uh, the last few slides we'll talk about how we make injury preventative work, uh, um, injury prevention a part of everything. So first with education. Again, first and foremost, the most important thing. And I'll use uh, some of our pelvis manipulation work to highlight that as well. So what we'll highlight here is, is something that is, is just a small thing that can change a lot of your movements. And if we think uh, track and field athletes especially, who kind of camp out in this position, right? Sort of butt back, hyperextended position. So that's a position that for some athletes makes them really, really good. So that's a good thing for them. It allows them to run as fast as they need to run. But with those athletes, am I gonna exacerbate that problem in the weight room by telling them to deadlift, power clean, and squat with that same hyperextended low back position? So if we educate them on how to manipulate their hips a little bit, then we change a lot of their movements for the better. So the first movement you'll see is simple, cat-cow. We've probably all seen this one before, all right? So as I'm pushing the ground away, I'm going into a posterior pelvic tilt, right? So I'm breathing out, hip is tucking under. So the athlete starts to feel what that feels like. Next, the supine 90-90 position. Again, breathing out, using my heels to pull down against the wall and posteriorly tilt. So again, the athlete feeling what, okay, what is my, what does neutral feel like for me? What does this position feel like for me? Does it alleviate some pain or does it, you know, kind of establish neutral for me? Same thing with this squat. So PRI squat, this comes from the Postural Restoration Institute. So basically I'm trying to breathe out, reach as far as I can forward, create that posterior pelvic tilt. And then once I dive into the squat, what happens? Looks like a little bit more of a neutral squat versus a hyperextension based squat. Okay. So so what, what I'm trying to do with that pelvis manipulation work, again, I'm not trying to tell athletes to, you know, for my rehab guys, I'm not trying to tell athletes to squat with a posteriorly tilted pelvis, but I'm educating them on what is a posterior, what is the action of posterior tilting mean? Because if you're in a hyperextended state and anteriorly tilted, if you can get out of that a little bit and then squat in a neutral position instead of a hyperextended position, then I think you're in a better spot. You start using the muscles that you're supposed to use. You start using your core instead of creating some false bony hyperextended base stability to perform those type of movements. So draw the stability from the core and you can only do that if we establish neutral first. So the next slide here, continuing with education. To prevent overloading of soft tissues in the skeleton, the muscle activity or rather the CNS and ligamentous structures must ensure that stabilization of the segments occurs in a centrated neutral joint position. So again, we're probably hopefully familiar with, you know, what does a neutral joint position mean? What does centrated mean? That just means a good position for your joints and then working from that good position. So the top video are bad examples. Bad RDL. Do we know that that's a bad RDL? There's no foot interaction. We may say, well, flat back, but where's his head position? Where's his eyes? Same with squat. We may say, okay, that athlete got to depth, but there's no heel interaction there. There's no foot interaction. So we're not maximizing our muscle activation. We're not maximizing the use of our posterior chain. Same with this RDL. Again, hyperextension base, eyes are up, bad everything. No interaction, no full foot act, uh, interaction. So are these exercises, do you think of this as performance? Did you have an injury preventative, uh, your injury preventative work, 10 to 15 minutes of that in the beginning? And then you said, okay, let's go into our performance work. Well, if we lift like this, then what is that injury preventative work worth, all right? And do the athletes know what we're looking for? Do the athletes know why this stuff, why this is not good enough, all right? So again, we're not using the musculature that we need to use, therefore not injury preventative in nature. So bottom video is hopefully uh, the good form. 
So we create pressure through relaxed shoulders, strong grip, using a hip hinge, not using an extension or hyperextension based butt back sort of cue. After each rep, we're resetting. So that's a good position for our athletes. I'm using my glutes and my hamstrings in that case, in that exercise. Same with the deadlift. Find your hamstrings first. Okay, we're kind of rolling back, keeping full foot interaction with the ground, staying neutral in terms of your head, from your head to your low back. Once you create that pressure, hey, remember those core exercises that we did, how you created pressure in those positions? Same thing with your deadlift. So educating from the beginning to the end. Same with your hand clean. We don't want to, heaven forbid, you have somebody that tells people to retract and depress during some of these barbell movements. Don't do that. You can't establish good pressure through that. That's hyperextension based false stability when you retract and depress. Create your pressure through core stability, through grip control or through a strong grip. Break the bar is a good cue. Breathe into your belly, create that tension and then go into the movement. So again, education for the athletes. And are we accepting that and saying, hey, you caught the bar or you squatted to depth? Or are we saying to that athlete, hey, this is actually, hey, you did it, but we need to do this better. Next, with injury preventative performance training. So we'll highlight here, uh, assess, accept, educate, individualize, periodize, coach. And the key word here is acceptance. So we want, we, what I'm going to touch on here is not trying to stick a square peg in a round hole and realize that everybody's different. So instead of saying that, we're going to try to make everybody do the same movement. We're going to try to make everybody back squat. We're going to try to make everybody deadlift. Let's categorize these movements and make them injury preventative. So if we're doing the movements that are right for this athlete, then we'll make them injury preventative. So the first exercise is a two kettlebell front squat. So that's a bilateral lower body push. As a strength coach, I categorize that into a lower body push, bilateral. That's the same thing as a back squat, the same thing as a barbell fr uh, front squat, into the same category. We can't load it up as much, so down the line, if we improve in some things, maybe we move on to a different exercise, but we accept the fact that for that person, that's the right exercise for that person. Same with this box squat. So this is a barbell, limited range of motion, box squat. For somebody, for some of your linemen that are 6'7", six, 6'8", six, and that we need to load them up, we need to do something with a barbell, but they can't squat to depth, maybe that's, that's a guy who has a precursor for some FAI issues, then why not limit the range of motion? That's still a great exercise. Box squat is still a great exercise, and we can load it up, but we don't need to squat everybody deep. You know, Maybe that athlete's not meant to do it. Pistol squat's another option. More complex option, but if you can't load somebody, if they can't ax we can't axial, axial load a, an athlete, or maybe they can't hold dumbbells, but they can do that, that's a good challenge for that person. That's a lower body push. Last one, barbell split squat. Same thing, we may, say that, we may find with that athlete, bilaterally they're not good in terms of squatting. So we can't put a bar on their back and back squat. But when we disassociate and we get them in that unilateral position, then they're pretty good. So let's roll with that exercise. So again, point being, accept the fact that, hey, everybody's different when it comes to these exercises. And we don't have to try to change all of our athletes to try to fit that, that one exercise. Last thing I'll talk about, injury preventative coaching. So the picture on the right, I believe, is somebody who is, is getting educated on, this is an example of uh, lateral speed, like a lateral speed day. So teaching pro agility or the 5-10-5 drill, which I think we're all familiar with, especially with the combine. So that's an athlete who's being educated on how to bend, where to touch the line, how to lean. So I'm about, I'm about to move to my left. So what's my shin angle? You know, where's my weight shifted? The athlete on the right, I think, is an athlete that's looking at the coach and ready for a whistle. So as strength and conditioning coaches, I think we, we have a bit of an obsession with whistles and cadences. So there's a time and place for that, for sure. You're warming up for a football game, you're on the field, you better make that look good. Guys are on a whistle, guys are doing the same thing. But when we're educated, let's, let's facilitate some sort of athlete ownership and quality of movement. So when I'm educating, some of it may not look all the same, but it's individualized. So if I have, you know, and you're probably thinking, well, how are we going to do that with a, a huge group of athletes with 30, 40, 50 people in the room? Well, you know, if you have your eight to 10 athletes that are the first group up and they have a drill where they're going to have to do this, we're going to have to, you know, 10 yard sprint, transition like you're going to change direction and I want you to look like this on the left. Explain the drill. What's expected of the drill? And then say, hey, group one, this is on you. Whenever you're ready to go, us as coaches, we're going to cue you up once you get there, but this is on you. Take some ownership in this. Think about, actually think about 
what you're trying to do instead of waiting and kind of panicking about a whistle and waiting to make sure that you look like the rest of the team. So hey, don't pay attention to anybody else here uh, as far as your athletes. This is on you, I want you to get this thing. So same with our, our hop example uh, earlier. So if we do hop to stick, and it's on the whistle. A lot of time you see a group of athletes and a, and a coach that's saying, okay, everybody on the team is doing this hop to stick. Okay, so we're gonna hop. W once we stick, wait for the next whistle. So this is on the whistle. Now most of your athletes are gonna hop, stick, look up at the coach and wait for that whistle and make sure they're looking the same as, as everybody else on the team. When in reality, we can just take one group and say, hey, we've got three reps. This is what the exercise looks like. This is the goal of the exercise. We're focusing on your core. This is the position I want you to end up getting into. You may not get it week one, but take your time, do this on your own. If you fall off balance, instead of trying to maintain it and afraid that you're gonna get in trouble, reset and you've got maybe two more reps after that, okay? And take your time and we'll coach you up as you go along. So I think when it comes to education, we have to kind of foster an environment of ownership and quality with our athletes. So probably asking, how do, how do I do this? Especially if there's strength and conditioning coaches or if you work in a team environment, the key is to work closely with your support staff. That's a huge thing. And we all talk about it, and I think sometimes it's a lot of lip service where we're like, yeah, you know, we need to communicate. But it needs to go beyond communication. We need to actually work together. Somehow bring your physical therapist and your athletic trainers, bring them into the weight room. Somehow get them involved. Because I think you save time on the back end. They may say, hey, well, that's not my job, that's your job. Well, again, we're gonna save time at the back end because you don't need to do as many rehabs. You don't need to kind of pull these athletes in and do uh, you know, quality work with them because it's already being done in the weight room. So we need, again, to work closely with your support staff. Keep an open mind. Build a bigger menu to always have a solution and accept the solution may not what you, maybe what uh, you think is beast mode, quote unquote beast mode. So as strength and conditioning coaches, that's, that's sort of a big thing. It's like, you know, this machismo, you know, sort of uh, sometimes ego is getting in the way attitude where m music is blaring, you know, it's that dark, dirty environment where that, hey, this is, we're building our attitude here. And that is a huge part of it. Don't get me wrong. I love, love that aspect of strength and conditioning. But it's okay if somebody's not doing the same thing as everybody else. You can still turn up the music for that kid who's doing a heavy split squat. You can still get after it with that kid who's doing the pistol squat. That's okay, all right? So keep that open menu and you have that solution for the athlete, what does that say? That's for them. So what we tell our athletes all the time is that the glory's on the field, the glory's not in the weight room. So 10 years from now, you're gonna remember that championship ring. You're not gonna remember how much you squatted in the weight room on a random, on a random Thursday in, you know, in, uh, in August or whatever it is during a testing day. You know? You're not gonna remember that. So make sure it's about the athlete, it's about performance. Realize everyone is not the same, and I touched on this before, and don't try to change them. We could still cater to that without losing the team dynamic. So utilize your support staff, utilize your PTs, your ATs, come up with this individualized strategy for your athletes. Sometimes we get scared about individualization as coaches because we don't know where to go. So it's, it ends up, it can be pretty simple, where all we need to do is create a couple buckets for our athletes. You know, this person's doing a certain lower body push, this person's doing a different one, this person's doing plyometrics, this person's doing Olympic lifts. You know, the, dude, the dudes that are doing plyometrics can't, you know, Olympic lifts, so that's why they're doing that. But we have options for everybody. I think where we got in trouble is we tried to correct everybody with our individualization. So with our individualized programs, we were saying, okay, well, this person needs this corrective and we're gonna try to change this and we'll end up doing this. When in reality, if we just say, what's right for this athlete? Make a couple different programs, bucket people into a couple different buckets, and you've got your individualized programs. Next is uh, educate, educate, educate. So empower the athlete for success without you. They're gonna be without you a lot. So if I turn my head, you know, I still want those athletes doing things in a, in a phenomenal way. So we have, if we have three, uh, three people at a rack, athlete one's doing a power clean, athlete two maybe doing another exercise, athlete three better be coaching athlete one. So if an, if an athlete at USC is doing something wrong on the platform, I'm not gonna yell at the athlete doing it wrong. I'm gonna be yelling at athlete number two who didn't coach up athlete number one. He's standing there, what? What's your worth there? Why is there three people at the rack? You're helping your teammates out. Okay, I want you to motivate. I want you to be there, you know, to get after it with your, with your teammates, but I also want you to coach them up. And we challenge our athletes to do, uh, to do that every day. And the last thing is 
find simplicity and quality. So I hear a lot, there's a, a, something called the KISS principle, which I don't know if some of you have heard or said is, the KISS principle is, is keep it simple stupid. So a lot of times you, you hear coaches that'll throw that term out there, and they're trying to explain that as a strength coach, hey man, we bench, we deadlift, we squat, we power clean, we keep it simple, we do the simple movements. Trouble is that those are the most complex movements that you can do in the weight room. So if you're keeping it simple with your programming, but you're using the most complex movements, that's a tough thing for, uh, for your athletes. That's a tough thing for your athletes to try to mold them into this sort of, hey, we're only doing these four exercises. Well, what if I can't do those exercises? So instead of keeping it simple with your exercises, find simplicity again in quality. And if we do that, I think we make all of our exercises and our whole sessions injury preventative in nature. And that's uh, some of my contact information, how you can get in touch with me, and uh, that's it, guys.